When you look into the poem, this is a photograph of me. We immediately hit at a crux of ambiguity. On one hand, the poem seems to narrativize the experiences of a female entity being oppressed, marginalized, and finally erased by patriarchal conventions and forces. So the poem gives us quite a melancholic reading. On the other hand, read from a completely different angle, the same signifiers seem to arouse in us a firm belief in the assertiveness of the female stage, the affirmative celebration of the extra resources of female body and the extra complexities of female expression which necessarily cannot be adequately conveyed by or conducted by realism, transparency of meaning or linear narratives. So instead of a monolithic or singular meaning, the poem gives us a contrapuntal, so to say. A combination of two possibilities, both of them quite pertinent to the feminist discourse today, victimization and celebration, giving testimonies about marginalization and eraser, and also confessing the urges and impulses and dreams of blooming incarceration and sovereignty. So we'll have to read this poem in terms of contraries. Now when we talk about Margaret Atwood, if we look into the time period of Margaret Atwood's writings and the tendencies of Margaret Atwood's writings in her over, we would immediately diagnose a cast between postmodernities and femalenesses. While the postmodern world has completely done away with an overarching, singular, monolithic, unitary meta-narrative, controlling and supervising, making possible and also drawing limits to writing and interpretation, art and expression, challenge and movement, and therefore Certainties, sureties in the conventions and genres of art, namely realism, namely transparency of meaning, namely an ab ovo unilinear narrative. These things are readily discarded in the postmodern art. At the same time, Femaleness no longer is going to be contained in the singular discourse of palmocentrism. In man-made language, it is no longer possible to conduct, limit, or sufficiently express what is femininity, what is female, what is femaleness. And instead of one type of the omen, which is, of course, a hypothetical other of patriarchy. We have quite a polymorphous and sometimes amorphous femaleness. So, a creature feminine and postmodern writing do share certain factors. Ambiguity is the highest common factor. Definitely in this poem, the ambiguities are readily postmodern and readily feminist writing belonging to the female stage. One of the possibilities that this poem evokes in the reader is reading the poem in a tone intuiting a tragedy. And a mellow twilight zone of darkness coming 
in the rhythm, in the lexemes, in the phraseology, and in the possible picture that the photograph might have contained. At the same time, if the poem is read in a jubilant tone, then we will see that the poem has hit the chord of female stage writing or ecritura feminine at the crux, at the core with juissance, with pleasure, with a celebration of fluidness and a negotiation of difference. So let us see the poem. The very first line of the poem is quite interesting with so many ironies and contrapuntals built in it. First word to inaugurate the poem is it, it was taken some time ago. Now it is an inanimate pronoun. But the photograph is of possibly and most probably a female speaker. So the female speaker cannot inaugurate her discourse with first person singular number pronoun or I. The female speaker cannot yet claim herself as a subjective affirmation. The word it gives us a suggestion of objectification, marginalization, and being designated as the other because the word it is the other to the selfhood proclamation I. Not even she in third person, but it. Now interestingly, Psychoanalysts like Lacquer did postulate that at the heart of our sense of myself, universally, there is a misidentification whose engineering we do not notice because it is unconscious and whose inevitability decides all of our thoughts, all of our actions, all of our ambitions, doings and happenings registered in the name of I or myself. That is called mirror stage in which the child discovers a sense of myself as a compensation for the separation from the mother and from the Edenic sanctuary of the imaginary stage of togetherness with the mother. As the child recognizes the mother not as self, the child can now formulate a sense of his or her own self. And the literal and often not so literal but conceptual apparatus that gives the child the opportunity of identification with himself or herself as I is a mirror reflection or image. Now the image is me and not I, but the child locates, registers and anchors the signifier I mistakenly in the signified of me. So lifelong we misidentify ourselves with our mirror image or our sense of myself called I with an it. It is the me in myself and I is what I wanted to proclaim as my sovereign cognitive subject. 
so this misidentification between I and me is in is a kind of universal predicament and boys and girls men and women pass through the same misidentification but for the males there is an adequate compensation because all through their cultural stay on earth in society in discourse in thought in doing the males will have a phallic privilege of chasing approximating and kind of donning as a uniform that is never theirs the phallus so they will engage into dominant phallic propensities which will compensate for the loss of I in me or it. But for the women, on one hand, the lack of any actual malehood in the bodily realm and the lack of access to phallic privilege in culture decided by the political policing of sexual performatives this lack is lifelong, this lack is publicly engineered into the way men and women are made into masculine and feminine. So, if we substitute I with it for the female, it is a complete case of being relegated to otherness and it was taken the photograph was taken at the primary level we have to understand the optics of photograph definitely we are here not talking about a selfie but we are talking about someone else taking our photograph and therefore deciding our image we cannot decide our image and the point of view or the perspective from which the photograph will be snapped or taken is not mine but the cameras and the persons who is handling the camera so being taken as a photograph is an objectification is an othering and more than that the word taken gives us in the paradigmatic axis a zone of spectrality, a zone of hauntedness, possessedness. You are taken means you are violated. You are taken means you are sexually taken. You are taken means you are taken for granted. You are taken means you are imprisoned, limited, incarcerated, and boundaries are set all around you. You are taken means you are possessed and you were taken some time ago. See here we are replacing the long long ago of a melancholic fairy tale with a contemporaneity of some time but the indefiniteness of some time along with the pastness indicated by ego is kind of hinting at a disappearance that is now reappearing because the photograph is an appearance of something that has already disappeared. So here we are talking about not presence, but the way something which is absent or something which has been absented can be represented. The photograph initially is discussed and described as a something which is unclear something which is not very much neat to the gaze of the reader, something which resists equations, identifications and diagnosis. At first it seems to be a smeared print, blurred lines and grey flecks blended with the paper. So maybe we are talking about an old photograph which was taken some time ago and because of its bygoneness, the photograph doesn't have any contemporary clarity. 
Or maybe the photograph was handled because the photograph is a photograph of a female speaker and cultural records in the official archives of civilization are quite neglectful towards a female voice or female entity. The photograph was not handled properly, the photograph was not well taken care of and the photograph was kind of neglected or ignored and probably dirt has accumulated on its surface. So the photograph for whatever reason lacks clarity and the photograph is more invisibility than visibility. However, more than that, there are other misogynic implications in the lack of clarity of the photograph or its smearedness. When we say smeared without changing the syntagmatic order or the order of the signifiers or the words in the phrase, we can actually substitute conceptualizations of the word smear with proxies or synonyms. When we say smeared, it not only means dirty in a literal sense of optics, but unclean, filthy, soiled, tarnished, disreputed, or slandered. And as a cumulative of all of these polluted, now look very, very clearly and carefully. Aren't these the adjectives or the qualifiers or the modifiers that a patriarchal culture readily uses to describe a female entity which it cannot contain, which is dangerous or threatening for us and which is abnormal? Isn't a not so normative omen unclean? Isn't a madwoman in the attic dirty? Isn't a prostitute's character soiled? Isn't an nymphomaniac, so to say, filthy? Isn't the character of someone who is polyandric tarnished? Isn't an omen who has challenged the dominant patriarchal cultural values readily disreputed? and scoffed at, scorned, slandered? Don't we consider the menstruating woman, the whore, so to say, the slave woman, the black woman, the proletarian woman, polluted in some way or the other? So, when we say smeared, and photograph is synonymized as image, that means if the photograph is smeared, that means the image is that of something which is polluted, something which lacks purity. And this is a ready-made formula that misogynic culture uses upon women. And when we say that the image has been blended with the paper, we are not only talking about the neglect that as an official record, the photograph or the narrative that it contains has undergone in the hands of a misogynic culture that overlooks women's testimony and confession, but we also mean that the subject which is there in the photograph has been rendered passive because it is planted or absorbed with the medium and with the forces of compulsion that the medium and the surrounding impose upon it. It has been objectified because it is no longer a person but blended with the paper. It is trapped within the conventions and limitations of the paper. It is gripped 
entirely within the paper. It doesn't have any autonomy. So the I in the photograph or the me in the photograph has become an it along with the paper under the forces of the paper, under the forces of male stream, language, writing, conventions, rules, norms. This is a case of appropriation of the female into a pathologically libidinal masculine monoculture. And not in the case of this poem, but in case of so many women's real life experience, a compulsion to internalize the dictates of such engineered appropriation of their self or I into it or other. Next lines. Then as you scan it, you see in the left hand corner a thing that is like a branch, part of a tree, probably balsam or spruce. Imagine and to the right, halfway up, what ought to be a gentle slope, a small frame house. Now this expression, small frame house, let's focus upon it because this is one of the most ambiguous phrases in these lines. A small frame house doesn't mean that the human endeavor has been belittled by the natural picturesque charms of the photograph because there is nothing to look at. These are the objects that you probably can discover if you can actually get through the smeared dirty obstacles in front of your eyes. It doesn't talk about the happy family, small family, nuclear house. Rather, the small frame house is not a home, but quite unhomely. We know that house is a symbol of domestication, the domestic. The omen lacks access to the public space. The omen writer the woman artist, the female artist, has no room of her own. So small frame house can actually mean a claustrophobic incarceration in a misogynic culture that wants to see, tame, contain and limit women's energy, activity and being within the small frames or boundaries or margins of the house. But on the contrary, there is a contrapuntal. How about women negotiating this no space of their own and trying to invent through the extra resources of their body, their womb, their vagina, their texts, their babies, their hospitalities, their welcomes, their intimacies, their juice sauce, their two lips always speaking together. A small frame of the zone of the female or the place of the female. However, the small frame house is actually disrupting the surrounding pressures of surrounding objects by standing out in spite of being trapped within the paper and the surrounding objects by its notification or announcement of some kind of autonomy, some kind of energy and initiation and assertion. So the small frame house can actually also stand for Ecriture Feminine, women's writing. In the background there is a lake and beyond that some low hills. Now the photograph was taken the day after I drowned. I am in the lake in the center of the picture just under the surface. Because she is just under the surface therefore she is invisible and the photograph of me is actually not a photograph of me because the me which is a deputy or a proxy for the I is already invisible under the surface and whatever is visible amid the smeared condition of the photograph is 
other objects but the woman herself is invisible she is inside the lake she is at the center of the picture but she is absent from the picture an absent center and this is where the irony as well as the contrary starts operating towards its climax you see very carefully I am in the lake and this is the first enunciate in the whole text or utterance in the whole text declaring primary imagination of being serene as a subject or a cognitive completion this is the first retrieval or recuperation of selfhood because we are encountering I for the first time previously it was it and as opposed to the pastness of the photograph being taken in the past the current declaration of this I is a present tense view verb if I am in the lake then we need to decode what the signifier lake stands for on one hand lake can stand for something that has drowned the omen something that has made the omen invisible something that has killed the omen artist and that means lake can stand for the surrounding society and its conventions which is definitely misogynic and phallocentric and whatever is present in the omen's image is not herself but other objects she is hidden and she has been erased therefore she is invisible but on the other hand if lake stands for fluidity if lake stands for naturalness if lake stands for a liberation from cultural imperatives if lake stands from something which is eco-feminist in its possibilities if lake stands for the bodily fluids of the woman if lake can be paradigmatically associated with the river alf which is so wild natural and spontaneous and original that not even kubla khan's stately pleasure dome can dominate it in zanatu if lake stands for the semiotic cora that cannot be erased from the symbolic order then i am in the lake I am in the malgudi of my body. I am in the old curiosity shop of my two lips speaking together. I am in the high berry, not of parlors and card games and marriage and matchmaking, but of the gypsies. I am in the lake. I am in the nature. I am in my fluidities. I am in my sexualities. I am in the maternal fluids in my ovary. And I am therefore the absent center of the picture whatever you have been actually confusing with presence is entirely a kind of political gimmick at the center of my writing it's my selfhood because it's a creature a feminine in my body it's my selfhood in my expression, in my photograph, in my image, I should be able to call myself I, as Kamala Das insists in her great poem, An Introduction. And when we say just under the surface, we are definitely hinting not on the floating above water, but beneath something which is deeper than the surface just under the surface maybe not so deep as the id or the unconscious of a psychoanalyst's postulation but in the depths of my vaginal invitation of taking in another body for Jewish sauce in the positive sum game of a shared Jewish sauce in the ethics of care and sexual pleasure in the ethics of motherhood just under the surfaces of my body 
There thrives my poetics. There thrives my resources. I am in the lake, in the center of the picture. I refuse to be at the margin. I refuse to be invisible. I refuse to be shallow and superficial. And I refuse to be it anymore. I am I. That means, on one hand, lake may be the patriarchal system that has engulfed and drowned the female. But on the contrary, the lake can also be a signifier for femaleness. Along with its all possible attributes like fluidness, like pleasure, like nature, like relief from cultural compulsions, like openness, like depth, and like a kind of mystic mystery or complexity that refuses realism to adequately contain or sustain its energetic. The poem goes on, it is difficult to say where precisely, because unlike masculine, which rarely identifies itself with the phallus, the omen is all over herself. So it is difficult to say where, and if we say that the photograph as a record has made the woman invisible and therefore we are not talking about celebration of femaleness but victimization of a woman, then also it is difficult to say where exactly the woman has been hidden, behind the parda and the ghanghat, behind the curtain and the closet, in invisibility or in the explosive shallow tinsel town of revealing nudity as a mode of sexual objectification in advertisement and media in form of hyper visibility where is the omen hidden in concealment and containment or in opening up for patriarchal and capitalistic nexus it is impossible to say how large or small I am. The effect of water on light is a distortion. See, it's not the effect of light on water, but the effect of water on light. Now, if light is Apollonian knowledge in the mind-body dichotomy, masculine, this embodied pursuit of meditative tranquility and cognition, then water, the feminine, the female, the Jewish sauce, the bodily, splashes upon the illumination and enlightenment and creates a deliberate distortion. And from the negative reading of the poem, if we are talking about victimization as the narrative core of this poem, then also the lines are quite meaningful because the effect of water on light is a distortion and the woman's image, as in the case of this photograph, is always distorted in patriarchal rendering of this image. But if you look long enough, eventually you will be able to see me. And this claim is parenthetical, it's within the brackets. And therefore, one can see it as a testimonial, contrapuntal, in an otherwise flat, simplistic poem of Omen's victimization. The image's implications continuously transform, especially that of the lake. On the one hand, as I have said, it drowns, and on the end, this brings us to the unsure relationship between truth and fiction that art only can address in a meaningful way. If you want to politically erase someone, you have to misrepresent that someone. If you want to otherize someone, you will have to silence that someone or distort the facts about that someone. So official dominant narratives would try to either preclude or distort the representation of the minoritarian entities that it wants to suppress and coerce. So the photograph in its smearedness and the lake in its fluidity can be about the radical unsurety of truth 
which cannot be grasped by any single meta-narrative, not even the so-called objective history of the past. Not even photograph is a faithful realism of the reality, especially when we are talking about women's reality or female mode of reality. As opposed to drowning, we can have three ready-made paradigmatic opposites, so to say. We can have swimming, which will be too phallic as a gesture because of its humanism with H capital, because of its anthropocentrism, and because of cultural training of the human form trying to dominate the natural form of water. Floating would be so passive, it wouldn't be female enough, it would be feminine, so to say, if we are using the word feminine in the traditional sense. And surfacing, which Margaret Atwood makes the title of her most famous, to my opinion, novel in which the anonymous female protagonist relinquishes culture, city, boyfriend, society, human relationship, dress, language, grammar, even the log came in by the lake and becomes a creature of the lake and she is firmly believing that she is going to be a mother of jellyfish and not any human child. The eco-feminist poetics of surfacing starts from its nomenclature. Surfacing as opposed to drowning, swimming, floating, is the act that women's writing can be iconically presented as women's writing is like surfacing inside the lake beneath the surface of the lake not going to the land not going to the lock haven not going to the small frame house not going to the hills, but not also dead and drowned, submerged, yes, into water, yes, into water as water, aquatic identification between the female and the fluid. Kamala Das's forest fire uses fire imagery here in this poem for the most potent icon of a creature feminine I find the lake has been used water has been used so we have two different possibly two different uh, or let's say opposite types of readings one here we have a female speaker whose voice had been silenced from official records, whose representation has become inadequate and finally erased from a photograph or image, and therefore we are talking about patriarchal culture invisibilizing and erasing the female form. And the second option, here we have a female speaker who is looking into her elements, celebrating her elements, and voicing how she is different. She is at the center of the lake as one with the lake, as opposed to any monument like the hills or the branch of the tree or the pleasure dome that Kubla Khan decreed. And 
If you ask me, I would say Margaret Atwood was probably ever of both of these possibilities. And as a postmodern writer, in a postmodern age, and as a feminist writer, in the female state, so to say, she would be very, very happy to conduct her lyricism with this superb ambiguity. Thank you.